Good afternoon, and welcome to Smithsonian Gardens webinar series, Let's Talk Gardens. Today, it is cold and dreary outside, outside of Washington, DC, but we're about to warm you up with some beautiful images that will remind you to start to take pictures of your garden all year long so you can reflect on what has worked and what has not worked. That's why I take pictures, so I don't have to rely on my memory. And with us today, we have a wonderful photographer. Hanale Lati is our photographer that takes our beauty shots and shots of our orchid collection. And we're so very glad to have her. I do want to remind everyone that if you have questions, please put them in the chat box. We will answer them at the end of the session and Hanale will be glad to try to answer most of your questions. If there's something we don't get to, it will be put in a resource page and posted on our website next week so that you'll be able to see the video again and you'll be able to see the answers to all the questions as well. And that we, we are not going to um, answer questions live Again, just put them in the chat box and that's the best way to be able to address us. So Hanale, thank you for joining us today and thank you for sharing more images and giving us more tips so we can do our best job and we can reflect upon our gardens all year long. So I'm gonna hand it over to you and I'm gonna disappear, but I'll come back on at the end of the session to help guide you through the questions that have been put in our chat box. Thanks again. I'll see you in a bit. Okay. All right. Well, hi, everyone. Um, like Cindy said, I'm Hanalei Lottie, and I am looking forward to sharing some photography with you today. We're going to do it in a couple different parts. Um, we're going to talk about the technical side, and then we're going to talk about different project ideas that you can do at home with your kids sort of to break the pandemic fatigue that we're probably all facing right now. Um, so let's get into it. So I just wanna introduce myself a little bit so you know who is giving you all of this advice today. Um, I went to school for photography, I'm one of those people. <laughs> and I went to school in Rochester, New York at RIT and have been working as a professional photographer for about 18 years now. And over the course of my career, I've exhibited my work all over the world, um, pub been published in lots of interesting places such as Nat Geo and um, Washington Post. And like Cindy said, currently I am a part-time contractor with Smithsonian Gardens and I'm documenting their display collections. So their living collections. Um, so we started with the tree collection along the National Mall, and then we have moved on to orchids. And um, starting this spring, we're gonna start photographing their display collections, which are perennials and, and um, such in, that, are, that are in the gardens currently. So, um, I do want to refer you to the webinar I did last summer that we um, we covered lighting, composition, and storytelling in the garden. So since we already covered those, I'm not going to touch on that today. But if you're interested in that, um, Sarah will put the link up in the um, chat box and um, you can check that out um, at your leisure. So today, um, after last webinar, I got a lot of questions about photo gear and exposure. So that's what we're going to cover today. Um, it's going to be fairly technical, but hopefully uh, approachable, trying to make it as simple as possible for everyone to understand what I'm talking about. Um, I know I have a wide range of um, photo enthusiasts and professionals here today. So hopefully everyone can get something out of what I share. And then I'm gonna wrap it up with a bunch of fun project ideas that you can use to beat the winter blues or 
just sort of inspire yourself um, creatively during sort of these weird times that we're all living through. All right, so let's go for it. All right, so the topic of photography gear can become very, um, you can dig deep. And, um, but today I think what I'm gonna do is just talk about what I use in the gardens when I'm working with um, Smithsonian. So I'm gonna talk about what's in my bag and why. Um, so my basic field kit when I am out shooting um, in the, um, along the mall is I uh, usually have two lenses with me. One is a wide angle lens. Um, when I was doing the tree collection, I use a tilt shift lens, which is a sort of a throwback to the, um, the four by five where I can um, tilt and shift the plane of focus so that when I'm looking at a tree, I don't have a keystoning effect. So that's a specialized lens that most people probably don't have. But I also like to use a 24 to 70 zoom lens um, that gives me a lot of options uh, in the garden for landscapes or, or close-ups and that sort of thing. And then I use a macro lens to sort of get in close and get those detail shots. And the one I use is 100 millimeters. I have a small flash that I carry with me um, and a radio transmitter so that I can um, make it flash off camera. So I set it up on a little uh, stand or a foot and I just put it in the garden where I want it. And then I go back to where I want to shoot and it flashes. It acts like the sun for me um, on cloudy days. It's really handy. And then I use a five in one uh, pop-up reflector, which anyone can use. It's probably the cheapest thing in my kit. It's about $35 to get one. And it's this little guy right here. Um, and it folds up really small and you can open it up and it will reflect light back into your image. So I'm going to show an example later on in the, um, in the program for that. Um, but that is something that anyone can use. You can use it when you're photographing with your phone, anytime you want to just add a little bit more light to the scene. Um, it's a really handy tool. You can also just use a piece of foam core or something like that, a white piece of paper for the same effect. But I find that the reflector is very useful. And then of course I have batteries and memory cards and lens cleaner because you're bound to get something on your lens at some point while you're out in the field. So that's typically what I carry. It all fits in a little backpack so that I can stay nice and small and um, keep my footprint small, especially when I'm on the mall and working around a lot of tourists and that sort of thing. Um, other equipment that I use when I need it, I have a telephoto lens um, that I use for photographing wildlife and birds and that sort of thing. That way I can get it, I can get in really close. I use a sturdy tripod if I want to shoot um, long exposures or I'm using one of those large telephoto lenses because it's really hard to hand hold those and, and keep a steady, steady hand. I have extra light stands and extra flash units if I, if I need them, but typically I don't usually use those in the um, outdoor space. They're more used indoors. And then I have a small step stool and a ladder and then neutral density and polarizing filters come in handy once in a while. I don't use them as much as I used to um, because Photoshop is so much better these days, but they do come in handy and they have a purpose. A polarizing filter, will help um, if you're shooting at, at high noon when the sun is right above you, it will sort of help limit some of the, the sun's rays from hitting your sensor. And then a neutral density filter will um, stop down the amount of light that comes into your, into your camera. So, and that's all I'm gonna talk about with gear because everyone will have questions and <laughs> everyone has some different things that they use, but this is what I use and it served me fairly well in the last few years. All right, so exposure. So we're gonna talk about exposure, but first I have a poll that Cindy can put up so I can get an understanding of where everyone is in their knowledge of exposure. Um, Cindy, can you, can you pop that up for everyone? 
Anale, I am embarrassed to say I forgot to put the poll on. Oh, so <laughs> I think that we will just ask our participants and why don't you ask the question and I will watch the chat box and let you know what they say. Okay, so um, the question was how, much, how comfortable are you with exposure settings and you are either um, don't know what that even means or you are have basic understanding of it. You have an intermediate understanding where you um, maybe shoot on auto, but you kind of know what, what it all means, or you have an expert level where you shoot on manual exposure and you set everything yourself. So let's see, well, see where I we are. I love the answers. There's <laughs> a lot of, I have no idea what you're talking about. Okay. Um, no clue. Uh, they, some, one person I just saw uh, uses manual exposure. So you have one person that really understands it. Um, a lot that are intermediate. So they okay. understand what you're talking about, but they're looking for more information. So I would go for that middle level and uh, explain it. You don't have to go into the weeds too much, uh, but it, it would be good to start from uh, an intermediate to a little bit lower level. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you everyone for responding. That really does help me to to um, explain this in a way that is helpful. And even if you're an expert, like every time I listen to a talk about exposure, I learn something. So hopefully there's something for everyone here. So exposure, in the most basic sense, it is the amount of light that comes in through your lens and hits the digital sensor or film to create your image. And it's controlled by three settings, the aperture, shutter speed, in ISO. So we're going to go through each one of these settings and then I'm going to talk about why you would use one or the other and then we'll do some case studies and then we'll move on into like fun project ideas. <laughs> so, okay, so aperture. Aperture refers to the size of the lens opening. So it was easier to see back in the olden days when you had a four by five and you could see the lens open and close. But the other way to think about it is when you are personally in a low light situation, the pupil of your eye will get bigger. And then if you're in a bright sunlight situation, the pupil of your eye will get smaller. Aperture works the exact same way. So it's measured in F stops. So when I talk about F2 or F4 or 8, that's what I'm referring to. Um, it controls. And the thing with aperture is that it controls the depth of field in your image. So depth of field is how much is in focus in your image. So if you're taking a picture of a tree and you have your, well, let me back up. Okay, let me go back and explain. So your f-stop refers to the size of the hole that the light comes through in your lens. And an f1.2, the smaller number f-stop, the larger the opening. Sort of like when you're in low light, the pupil of your eye is bigger. And then f32 or f10, those are smaller openings. However, they, they give you a larger depth of field. More things are in focus when you shoot at f32 than you do at f1.2. Let me show you an example just so that you have a visual. I'm a very visual person, so when this stuff is explained to me, I need to be able to see it. So this is an example of a lily, a close-up of a lily, and this shot was, was made at f1.8, where the, the opening was very large, and a lot of light was coming in, but very little is in focus, right? There's maybe, I don't even know if anything is tack sharp in this image, that's my bad, but at least you have a little bit here. And you kind of get that nice ethereal look. Um, some people like to call it bokeh. Um, and it's a really nice um, sort of dreamy look. Whereas if I shot, when I shoot this at F22, with a nice small hole in my lens, everything is in focus. And that has its 
benefits as well. It's just good to know which setting does what so that when you're out in the field, you can say, oh, I really want everything to be in focus. What does that mean? What do I need to do? Oh, I need to use a, a small aperture but a high aperture number. It's a little confusing and I get it, but we'll, we'll keep going here. Here's another example um, where this is a large opening, small f-stop number, very little in focus. This is a high f-stop number, small opening, everything is in focus, okay? That's like the key to learn f-stop and aperture. Um, so just keep that in mind that the larger the f-stop number, the more that will be in focus in your image. And this applies to phones as well. Some phones now give you these options. So just because you have a phone doesn't mean that this doesn't apply to you. All right, the next exposure setting. I'm going through these quickly because we only have an hour, but I just wanna give you sort of a basic sense of what everything is. So shutter speed, is a little easier to understand. It's the amount of time that the camera shutter is open to take the picture. So it's the amount of time that it, the camera opens up, allows light in and then closes, okay? So you utilize shutter speed when you want to freeze or blur motion. And that makes sense because it's like, well, how long is the shutter open? If something's moving in your frame, it's gonna blur because it's open for that amount of time. So the longer shutter speeds that you use, you're gonna need a tripod so that you are very steady. And that goes for shutter speeds starting at like a 30th of a second to upwards of 60 minutes to an hour. And we can get into that another time. Um, but shutter speed is pretty straightforward. It controls the motion in your image. And I, don't have a plant example for this because I feel like water is the best example for shutter speed. So this was shot at 15 seconds. So the water is moving, it's the waves, it all becomes sort of this abstract scene. Whereas here, the birds are frozen above the water. You can see detail in the water and the shutter speed was very fast. It was one 1250th of a second. Um, so it was very quick because I wanted to freeze the motion of those birds flying away. All right, the last one is ISO. And it's a little bit of a holdover from the film days where when you bought a roll of film, you had to decide how sensitive it would be to light. Um, and now with digital sensors, it's, it's similar. <clears throat> And it's measured the same way. So you have an ISO of 100 is less sensitive to light than ISO 3200, for example. And my, my advice <clears throat> with ISO is to set this setting last. Only use it when you need it. Um, I always keep my ISO at 100 to start with um, because that will give me the cleanest picture because the, the higher up you go with your ISO, the more grain and color shifts you'll have. So let me go into an example with that. So this was photographed for an herbalist in Maine actually, and she had just harvested her hyssop and we were out in the field and it was a bright cloudy day in this image on the, on the left. So I, I could use a, a, ISO wasn't a factor in my exposure settings because I had plenty of light to use. Whereas when we went inside into her, her very poorly lit workspace, I had to use a higher ISO in order to get anything, any exposure whatsoever. So this is sort of an example of when you would use um, ISO to bring more light into your scene, okay? And then it's always with a caveat. So this image was shot on a boat in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean on a full moon, under a full moon. Notice nothing is really in focus because I was moving and it was very dark, but um, 
I really like this image because it has this ethereal uh, look to it, but I had to use an ISO of 6400, which is really high. And in this close up, you can see that there is a lot of grain, the image is breaking up a little bit. So that's what happens when you use a high ISO. Yes, you get more light in, but because the sensor is like really pushing its pixels, you're gonna get grain and digital noise. And sometimes some of these um, little dots will be different colors because it's just pushing so hard to like read that light. So this is why only use ISO when you need it. And in this case, I needed it because I had no other light um, in order to make my exposure. And I couldn't use a long shutter speed because I was physically moving in a boat. So hopefully that's, that's clear. Now I know all of this sounds very confusing and technical. It took me years to really fully understand how to use exposure um, to my advantage. And at this point now, it's sort of invisible to me when I'm out in the field and you will get there. You just have to practice. Um, so my advice is just to sort of keep everything very simple, change one setting at a time. And when you're out in the field, ask yourself, okay, so what am I trying to do with this picture? What is most important? And then ask yourself, which setting is the primary one I need to accomplish this goal? Let's go into a case study. So many of us are out in the gardens, want to photograph bees in pollination mode. So what am I trying to do? I'm trying to photograph a buzzing bee pollinating a flower. So if you think about it, you really need to be able, the primary focus of that image is to freeze motion. So I would use shutter speed is my first setting that I will set. So let's see the image. So here's what my exposure setting was for this image. I shot it at one one thousandth of a second. So it was really fast, it froze that motion, no problem at all. I use an aperture of F5, which isn't the biggest opening, but it's pretty large because I still wanted to have the plant sort of go out of focus, but I needed enough in focus so that the bee was completely in focus as well as the flower. So if I had used a F2 or something like that, it wouldn't have given me that, that amount in focus. So because these two settings had to be what they were and it was early morning and I didn't have enough light, I had to use an ISO of 640, which is higher than I normally use, but my camera is really good. So it can handle that level of ISO use. Every camera is different. I don't really have a lot of noise going on in this image, um, but that may help to make you understand why I chose um, an ISO of 640, whereas normally I would try to keep it lower than that. But it was important to me to freeze the motion and keep enough in focus in the image in order to, to capture that bee on that flower. Okay. Okay, here's another case study. And this is where I tell you that learning how to use manual exposure settings will be a game changer when you're out shooting. So what am I trying to do? I'm trying to capture a snowy landscape on a bright sunny day. What's my primary setting? It depends. It depends on whether or not it's windy or not. If it's really windy and I don't want a lot of motion blur in my image, then I need to focus on shutter speed first. If I wanna have just a little bit in focus and then take advantage of that sort of ethereal look, I need to have a wide open aperture of say two or 2.8, F2 or 2.8. However, so if you are photographing this on auto exposure, your camera is going to underexpose and the snow is going to look gray because the camera's metering is just trying to look at this scene and make an average reading of what it thinks is a proper amount of light 
that should come through. So in order to keep snow white, you have to adjust the exposure manually to let more light in. So let me show you. So this was the scene. And this top reading is what I shot it at. So I used one sixty fourth, six hundred fortieth of a second, f four at ISO one hundred. It was a bright sunny day. All I needed to do was control the light, and I kind of kept the, it the aperture open wide enough so it wasn't all completely sharp. Um, I do that a lot. I don't always shoot with um, everything being sharp. I like sort of that ethereal look. However, my camera setting. If I kept it on auto, it would have shot it at uh, 1 1250th of a second. So my snow, all of like this bright area in the snow would have been gray. So there'd be no highlights in the image. So this is just an example because we're in winter um, to keep in mind while you're out shooting. And if you're using a phone, you can adjust that exposure um, by pressing on the screen and dragging up. So if you're on an iPhone, that's what I use. But you will have to adjust manually when you're working with snow or anything that is dominantly white or black. Speaking of black. So I bring this case up because we're gonna talk about it a little bit later. Um, if you're photographing house plants in your home and you wanna do something like a plant study, and just photograph um, the leaves or the flowers or just a, an aspect of the plant. All you have to do is get a black board and put it up behind the plant, angle it so that it's not getting any light on it, and then put your plant in like a shaft of light, of window light. Um, so in order to photograph this and set your exposure settings, the most important thing for plant studies is to focus on the focus. You want everything in focus or at least enough in focus so that there's enough detail for, for everyone to, to see what you're looking at. So the primary setting here will be aperture. But I'm also going to mention, again, you're gonna have to set it manually because this image on the left is what my camera did with auto exposure. It overexposed because the primary part of the image was black. So it was trying to um, make up for how dark it was in the image, whereas I don't, I don't want it to. I want it to stay black. So I had to manually set my exposure in order to, to capture something that had detail and um, wasn't completely blown out. Like this image is completely blown out because the leaf was so much brighter than the background. And that's why, like if you're using manual, you can control that. You just have so much more control. All right, I hope that makes sense. <laughs> All right, and then this is just an example to go back to my gear of where I use a reflector. <clears throat> it's the same setup of um, the house plant in front of the window. And this image I shot without any kind of reflector, it's just the window light coming in from this side. And there's lots of shadow here. There's not as much detail. It's not a bad image, but this is what happens if I throw in a reflector, it gives me so much more detail in, in the um, stem of this um, leaf. So it's very easy, you just hold it up and reflect that light right back in. So that was just a little bonus tip for you. Okay, so I know exposure is hard, um, but hopefully um, you can get these key takeaways. So each setting has its own purpose. Aperture, the f-stops, are for focus, depth of field of the image. So how much it controls, how much is in focus in your image. Shutter speed controls motion and freezing motion or blurring motion. And then ISO you use to lighten or darken as needed. Okay, so the key is to decide on your primary setting, 
then adjust the other settings as needed to balance the light in the scene. You're either adding light or you're subtracting light. That's all, that's all you're doing. You're either adding it or you're subtracting it so that you have an image that you um, like. And it's so much easier now because you can see it as you shoot. Um, when I was learning, I had to use film and write notes of what all my settings were and then wait a week to get my film back and see what I did wrong. And there was always, everything was wrong. So now take advantage of the ability to use digital cameras and sort of work it out while you're still in the field and not have to go back a week later to reshoot something. Just practice with it and play with it. Um, it, it comes with practice. All right, so that was a lot of technical. So now we're gonna have a little bit more fun and talk about uh, project ideas so that we can kind of get through this pandemic fatigue. I don't know if anyone else is feeling it, but I have been definitely feeling it lately. Um, just the monotony of day-to-day -day life right now is, is a little bit much. So, and I know I don't have children, but I know people with children may be looking for different ideas that they can do with their kids. Um, all of these are things that you could do with your children. Um, so hopefully we'll get into it and see if, we can find some inspiration um, here. And then we're gonna ask you guys if you could share them with um, Smithsonian so we can share them with everyone. So this image actually is just an example of a reflector being in use. Pretend this is a window, window lights coming across this flower. And I just put a piece of foam core to reflect it right back in. That's as simple as it gets. Um, and anyone can do it. <laughs> This was an image that of a behind the scenes shot from the tree collection um, that we did a few years ago. All right, so the first thing, cause I know a lot of you guys are horticulturists and scientists, um, maybe start doing some plant studies of your neighborhood plants or your backyard. If you have a backyard or your house plants, you can start photographing all the different botanical keys that um, show up over the course of the year. We still have plenty of time to do this. So you can bring them inside. You can photograph them from different angles and then put little sequences like this together. It's just kind of a fun way to um, look at images. So it's not just one image at a time. You can do that and print them out, send them to people. You can do plant studies out in the field as well. If, if you don't have a backyard where you can clip plants and bring them inside, um, please don't clip plants in our public gardens, um, but you can go out and photograph them. Um, just the key here is to sort of look for limiting distractions and keep it as simple as possible so you, people can focus on uh, the botanical um, keys that you're trying to show them. Now's a great time to photograph bark. And you can do that if um, in your neighborhood and start taking um, assessment of what is there and um, keep track of the trees in your neighborhood. It's kind of a fun way to spend some time and be mindful of what is around you. You can also just focus on different textures. Uh, bark, every tree is different and it's really an interesting thing once you kind of get into to photographing all the different textures that you see. This I think looks like an eyeball. <laughs> and I always love trees that have, have that kind of feature. You can shoot them in black and white. I love photographing in black and white. Usually if I'm just out photographing on my own with no assignment, I just turn my camera to monochrome and photograph in black and white. I love it. Um, it just simplifies everything. It, you, you just are focusing on light and dark and, um, and I just find it really soothing and interesting and just a different way of seeing things. This is a, um, an ash tree and the ash borer um, out at the Virginia um, Arboretum. And then once you've photographed all the things in your neighborhood or your backyard or your house, you could put together a little notebook. Um, I believe that the US, um, Geological Society, no, Botanical Society, 
Anyway, it's called Nature's Notebook. If you look it up online, you can um, start documenting the things in your neighborhood and um, add it to a listserv, I believe. It's just sort of a fun way to, um, to see what's in your neighborhood and learn more about the trees there or the plants there. This is um, a ginkgo that's at the Hopped Garden uh, downtown. And this is an example of what we were shooting when, when we were collecting all of the data about um, the tree collection there. So we photographed it in four different seasons. We photographed the bark, the buds, the leaves. Um, this tree is a male, so I didn't have the fruit to photograph, but some of the other trees in the neighborhood, in the collection have, have the fruit, which nobody likes. But um, anyway, it's just a good way to, it's a great science project for kids. And it's, and it's a, it was fun putting this together just for this talk. Like I hadn't done this before and I think I'm gonna do it for the trees in my backyard, just to have a documentation of what, what is here right now during this interesting time. Moving on, um, like I said, photographing in black and white can be really interesting. Um, it forces you to look for textures and patterns. Um, you really start to see lights and darks in a different way. When I was learning photography, all I did was photograph in black and white. Like our teachers, for two years, we photographed for in black and white only. Um, which was a little crazy at the time. Like I was like, why can't I shoot something in color? And they're like, you have to learn how to see light and dark. So challenge yourself to see that. Look for monochromatic landscapes. There's a lot of them right now with the snow. Um, and they can be extremely beautiful. Speaking of snow, you can start looking for abstracts. Look for shapes and textures. I love shooting abstracts. It's my favorite. <laughs> I like taking something that you don't normally see and, and drawing attention to it with a photograph. The winter garden can be a very interesting place, especially um, in gardens where they leave um, the, the leaves on. And they don't cut everything back for winter. Um, the light in winter is amazing. Every, every day is just nice and low and warm. It's a great time to be out in the garden. Um, looking for chaos, which is what I love. You can try new tools. So this is a fun one. Um, all you need is a tripod, a flashlight, and a long shutter speed. And you can um, paint with light. And this is something I haven't done a lot of, but it is really fun. Every time I do it, I discover something new. So all of the light in this image here on the cherry blossoms, I just use a flashlight to like sort of paint what I wanted. And it was a really fun effect and I look forward to doing more of them, but it's a fun way, especially to get kids involved now that um, they're home, you could, um, it'd be a fun nighttime project, maybe when it's a little warmer um, to paint with light. And when you have digital, you can always see what's happening, which is really fun. This is a new one. Um, well, not really new, but doing double exposures. So taking two images and sandwiching them together. You can do this in Photoshop or you can, um, there are lots of photo apps on your phone. I just loaded up a few pictures that I shot and into my phone and used a photo app for this. There's lots of different ones out there. I can't really recommend one or the other. They're all have their own benefits but they really are fun. Like this image was just the image of the tree. And then I sandwiched an image of all the footsteps that were walking by it, um, which was kind of a fun way to tell a little bit of a story in one image. And same here, this is an image of um, pelicans flying over the Chesapeake Bay and then um, trees in winter. It was just sort of, I liked the layering and the texture of, of using the double exposure. You can do collages. Um, if you're feeling a little stressed, uh, this is a great mindfulness practice where you just take different plant parts and sort of as assemble them on a sheet of paper and then you can photograph that. 
um, that's kind of a fun one to do. When I was doing this one, I felt so calm and peaceful. And it was the only thing I was thinking about, sort of a nice thing these days. And then cyanotypes. So a little history, photo history lesson added in here. Uh, cyanotypes were invented in 1842 by John Herschel. And they are also known as blueprints. If you think about construction projects, the blueprints, this is where it all comes from. They can also be called photograms. And Anna Atkins was a botanist and photographer back in 1842. And she was the first to use the process to record plant life. Um, and she published a book of photographic illustrations using this process. Um, she's considered the first women, woman photographer and the first photographer to publish a book, which is really interesting. Um, and these are so easy to do. So they, I had them when I was a kid, they were called, you could get at like art museums, these kits called sun print kits. And what it is is paper that has been treated with two chemicals that are listed there. I'm not going to try to say them. And then you place objects on top of them, put a piece of glass over it, and then just bake it in the sun for however long. I'll show you the process. This is this image baking in the sun a couple of weeks ago. And it's just a selection of poinsettia leaves and some Japanese paper that I put down just to give it a little bit more of a um, compositional element. And I baked it in the sun for about 10 minutes and then I took it out and um, washed it in um, water, just plain water. You just rinse it off and then you just dry it on paper towels and then you have this sort of unique print. Um, so you can do this with any object, it doesn't have to be plants. You can use different papers, you can use objects. When I was a kid, I probably used dinosaurs or rocks or shells or any kind of thing um, that you find interesting to make a design with. They're super fun. There are kits online that are very inexpensive um, to get you started. So you don't have to deal with the chemicals yourself. And they're fun. <laughs> Just a different way of being creative. I loved doing them when I was a kid. And when I got these in the mail the, a few weeks ago to, to do for this talk, I was so excited. It was so fun. And they all come out a little different. All right. So, and then lastly, I just want to encourage you guys to make prints. It's sort of a lost art. Everything stays on our, on our camera phones or on our hard drives, but, um, making prints or greeting cards that you can send out to people, especially right now, I've been sending a lot of cards out to people randomly. Um, it's just another way of connecting with your friends and your family. And then because Valentine's coming up, I would encourage you to send some Valentine's Day greetings. We made um, these with Smithsonian Gardens of some of the images that we've been making for the tree project and the orchid project. And my colleague, um, Kaylee Walters, came up with these great little puns that we could use. And um, so there's about 16, 15 or 16 of them on the website. I think Sarah will put the link in the chat box. And you're welcome to download them and print them out like you did. They're set up like kids' valentines in a box. And you're welcome to print them out yourself and send them around and a little cheer kind of a fun way of using your image. You could do this with your own images. There's no, there's no limit here. So we've got about 15 minutes left. Uh, I just wanna say um, with ex as far as exposure is concerned, I would really encourage you to try to work in manual mode and set the settings yourself. Um, you'll find you make a lot of mistakes but you will learn from them and you will grow and your pictures will become much more interesting. You'll have, you'll feel like you have more control over the process, um, but it does take a lot of practice. So um, I would encourage you to at least try what's, what's it going to, it doesn't cost anything really to um, make pictures these days with um, all of the um, digital space these days. So, and then also I want you to try new things. 
and be open to alternative ways of seeing the world. Photography is not just um, taking a picture of what you see. You can, you can take it anywhere you want. Um, and then be present, play, experiment, and stay curious. Um, really the key here is just to have fun out there. Photography can be a very technical um, art form, but if you're not having fun with it, then, then why are you doing it? <laughs> All right, so now we're gonna go for some questions and Cindy's back. I'm sure I have lots of them. <laughs> you do. <laughs> but first I have to say thank you. That was delightful and we all learned a lot and you're very encouraging to go out and use manual settings. Uh, and you're right, you can do so much more with it. But I mm -hmm. highly encourage people to do it when they have time. Don't try to do it on Christmas Day when you're trying to take pictures of everyone because <laughs> you'll set yourself up for failure. Do it when you have time and play, play, play. And I really like that you brought back those uh, cinegraphs. Is that what they're called? I used to do that when I was a kid all the time. And it is so much fun. It takes all the work out of everything and you can be as creative as you want to. So thank you for all the information and for the beautiful photographs you made it very easy to understand so, so. great job you did <laughs> when we practice that'll be another thing but yeah. you made it easy to understand <laughs> so a couple technical questions when you are out and if you don't have a tripod or you don't want to use a tripod i hike and i don't like to take a tripod but i still like to take pictures what do you use do you the the uh, question offered a black rapid shot i'm not quite sure what that is a belt or something to hold uh to hold it still do you have any tips for keeping your camera still so you can still shoot pictures without a tripod yeah so i I rarely use a tripod. I use them only when I need um, to shoot a long exposure. Um, basically, if you're having trouble with camera shake or you're, um, you need to be still, um, you can always use your body and mm -hmm. um, a building or a tree or something and just sort of prop yourself up um, against it and try to get as steady as possible um, and breathe. Because <laughs> if you hold your breath, you start to shake a little bit. So um, when I'm out hiking, I, I do not bring a tripod unless I'm going to do night photography or something like that. Um, and in which case I'm not hiking far. <laughs> I don't yes. like carrying things. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I mean, that's what I would do. I use um, for a camera strap. I just have like um, one that goes around my hand so that it helps to steady um, the camera in my hand. Um, so that would be my advice is just to, to use your body or uh, an object to sort of steady yourself as much as possible. Yes, not a problem. Uh, Someone asked if there was a hiking backpack you'd recommend for your photo gear? Yes, I have one, um, through, it's, um, what's it called? It's by uh, Think Tank, um, is a professional photo gear company. Um, they're run by photographers and they have really great um, selection of bags. And my backpack is one of their backpacks and it's, it's awesome. It's nice Terrific. and small and can fit everything I need. Okay. And this one is pretty, I, I, several people asked it, but it's, it's really, I think, up to the person that does it? What kind of camera do you use? Uh, do you prefer one or the other, or is just whatever's in your hand? Um, I for, I use Canon cameras um, just because that's what I have all my lenses in, and it's a huge investment to um, purchase lenses of good mm -hmm. quality. So I've stuck with Canon throughout uh, my career in the digital space before I used Nikon. Um, all of them at this point put out really great cameras. I don't think you could go wrong. I know Sony is really good. Fuji ca cameras have good reviews. Uh, it doesn't really matter um, so much to me which brand I'm using. They're all sort of a tool. Um, and they're all at this point really good. <laughs> so. mm -hmm. I agree. And that's not an endorsement from the Smithsonian. That is an endorsement <laughs> from a photographer. So thank right. you for that information. We appreciate it. 
What lens did you use for the B picture? Uh, that was my um, 100 millimeter macro lens. Okay, that's, yeah. that's good to know. And then to shoot in black and white on a, on a phone camera, do you know how to make that happen? On your phone? Mm -hmm. um, I, yeah, I think I might have to answer that later. Um, you can answer that later. That's fine. We'll put I'm that. I'm pretty sure you can. Story. I just, I would have to look. Mm -hmm. I know you and can. Fact, yeah. It would be great if uh, people are asking a lot of questions about iPhone and how to up their game with an iPhone. And I know there's a lot of information available online. So we'll put that in a link too uh, mm -hmm. in our resource page so that we can share that information because iPhones, even though they're not the same as the DSLR, are improving and improving and improving. Mm -hmm. So you can improve your skills as well. Yes. Um, okay. Do you, you, you did answer this one. You did keep notes when you were doing it with film. Do you still keep notes when you're doing it with the digital? Okay. <laughs> the only notes I keep now are uh, plant names because <laughs> I have to add them to the, to the keywords afterwards. Um, with digital cameras, they embed all of the information um, that you're shooting. Um, it embeds the exposure information in the file, so I don't have to keep notes on that anymore. Yeah, I, I, if you could see my bookcase, I have notes, notebooks when I was shooting just so that I could do the same thing. Yeah. I must say, though, it was much easier for me to do it in manual when I had the old film cameras. I'm getting really spoiled and lazy. So don't feel bad <laughs> if you're out there and you're doing the same thing, but I do agree that you should practice. There is an equation that it calculates the depth of field. Do you know the equation or do you know, I will look that up then too. Uh, that was it. I have seen them before. I would say yeah. I would highly suggest Googling that question uh, to the person that asked it and it will come up with the answer because I've seen that in several different formats uh, that show you what the equation is to be able to get it. Yeah, it depends on um, what lens you're using. Um, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I don't know the equation offhand. Uh, I've seen charts that I find more helpful than uh, an equation. Math was not my favorite subject in school, so uh, I, I like the graphs and I can I can find those and link them in the um, follow up. OK, great. That's terrific. Thank you. And for those, this is a little bit more technical to the histograms, because I know on my camera, I will use histograms occasionally, especially if I'm doing close ups. Do you use histograms on your camera? OK, all the time, all the time. But the thing to keep in mind is like if you are photographing a plant study on black, um, you want that black background to be black. So mm -hmm. the histogram might not look like a perfect histogram because it's going to be very much over to the shadow side. Mm -hmm. Whereas like if you're out like for this image or something like that, your histogram will look fuller <laughs> than it should. will yeah. in a plant study. So it's just the histogram is good if you at least know how to read it and um, can associate it to what specifically you're shooting. We should also define what is a histogram? It just jumped right in, but we should tell uh, our audience what a histogram is and how beneficial it is. It's, I mean, it's simply stated, it's a graph of the amount of light that's in your um, image. So it, it shows from light to dark, or shadows to highlights, how much information is, is in the image. That's it. Thank you. It, yeah. Uh, yeah. It, it, once you once you play with it, you'll see. You'll find it mm -hmm. on the setting on your camera, and then you'll be able to play and see. Um, your side. This one is really a different. Your slide template for your presentation. They love it. They want to know <laughs> what it is, so they could use it as well. Oh well, it's. Um, I use Keynote because I'm on a Mac, mm -hmm. and it's just. I don't know, the clean, modern look. Okay. <laughs> That's clean, the funny thing. 
clean modern or mac uh Something you know, like that that. Is a, that's a big question we always use for our our powerpoint presentations too what do you use for the background yeah and then, well and i did change the background to it to be gray and then change the text to white because i've been requested to do that for a different presentation that i'm doing so. yes no it's very good to have that combination because you can read the white better in a powerpoint than you can black so that's a yeah. good thing to remember you mentioned um the val the valentines that you talked about i'd also like to encourage people your project where you placed the flowers on a piece of paper and took a picture and made a collage out of it we have the language of flowers on our website and the language of flowers that's a Victorian way of sharing information without text without verbalizing uh, what your message is but you use the flowers so we of course all know Valentine's Day send your passionate lover a Valentine of a red rose but if they're just friends you better send, send them a yellow rose so they don't get the wrong yes. idea so I like to confuse project. people no <laughs> <laughs> but I like the project because you could use your collage idea and yeah. create your own Valentine to be able to send to your special person or persons mm -hmm. uh, to be able to go along with it. Another technical, what is the best setting for the grass photo? Because the, the person that asked the question also wanted to be able to have the grass photos in focus or the grass seed heads in focus, but blur the background. How do you do that when there's so many different depth of focus in that grass uh, uh, picture? How do you concentrate on just the grass? Um, well, that's a case where you would um, choose your aperture setting first, because if you only want the grass seed to be in focus and the rest of it to be out of focus, um you would have to choose a an aperture in the like f4 range and then focus put your focus point right on that grass seed focus on that and then the rest of it should kind of go out of focus um you can play with it there i don't know that there's a the best setting it really just depends on your lighting conditions and and all of that but you would want to use a larger um lens opening so a uh, a smaller numbered uh, f stop. Okay, and it is a bit more difficult when you have so many things. Little little objects are harder to do that with. So keep playing, yeah. and and I highly suggest you you do exactly what you said. Practice, 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 because it's mm -hmm. going to be different for many situations. Take multiple shots of one thing too. I think yes. is another yes. <laughs> yes, especially as you're learning experiment with the different settings and and then when you get home see what happened when you mm -hmm. change the f-stop to f22 versus f2 just see it. it it certainly makes it easier next time you're out in the field be like oh yeah that's what happened when i set it to that setting and this is what happened to the other setting good tip if you shoot a picture in color in the field and then go back and turn it to a black and white image in Photoshop, is it going to give you the same results as if you shot it live in black and white? Probably. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, when you're photographing with a digital camera um, and you set it to like the black and white setting, that is simply the camera's computer just converting that color image to black and white on your display screen so uh, it's the same thing that would happen if you take it into uh, photoshop or lightroom mm -hmm. and make it black and white um, yeah okay terrific well i can't tell you how many compliments you've received received uh, in the chat box so okay. people are really enjoying what you're sharing and have really enjoyed the special tips that you've given us today so thank you for that, Hanalei, and we appreciate everything you're doing for us. Uh, I will say goodbye for now, but I encourage people to come back and maybe I can get you to come back on too, to lead us for the step three. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. And thanks to everyone who have joined us. And we look forward to see you next week uh, with another presentation. Have a good afternoon. Bye.